So yes, if we move on uh, to our next speaker, uh, Amory Taylor, who will be, I'm sure, known to many of you here. She is one of that very select group um, uh, of equestrian experts who are regularly instructed uh, in these cases. But I'd just like to emphasize the backstory, as it were. She has a wealth of experience uh, in the equestrian world, which equips her to uh, provide uh, expert witness uh, advice. Uh, at age 20, she was running uh, a competition livery yard, training horses and riders uh, whilst also competing professionally. At age 21, she was, she was selected to represent uh, GB at the World Games in Australia, the youngest competitor there, and she was placed fifth. She's a fellow of the British Horse Society, which is almost as a select group as the group of experts. She tells me that there are 58 fellows worldwide, so clearly a, a, a very um, a high qualification to achieve. She's an international eventing judge, uh, and she adjudicates at high-level events around the world, including championships and the badminton horse trials. And she's very kindly agreed to speak to us today um, on an equestrian expert's view uh, of the Animals Act. We've heard from the lawyers, and so we'll now hear from an expert, Emery. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for inviting me today. Being asked to talk about an aspect of law in front of a room full of eminent lawyers is a little daunting, but I do welcome the chance to talk about the Animals Act from an equestrian's perspective and highlight some of the challenges that Charlie Lane and myself face. In talking about the complexity of the Animals Act, I take some comfort in Lord Nichols of Birkenhead and what he said. Unfortunately, the language of Section 2.2 is opaque. In this instance, the parliamentary draftsman's seal for brevity has led to obscurity. Over the years, Section 2.2 has attracted much judicial obloquy. <laughs> Following on from everything you guys have already said. So Section 2.2 makes provision in respect of civil liability for damage done by animals. Section 2.1 is liability for dangerous animals. So if you've got any tarantulas or pet poisonous snakes, you will be liable whatever. But with Section 2.2 for non-dangerous animals, provision has been provided and has to fulfil three limbs for it to succeed, which we've talked about. In essence... Was the injury likely to be severe? Was the injury caused by characteristics not normally found in horses, except at particular times or in particular circumstances? And would those characteristics be known to the animal's keeper? So why should this apply to horses? Horses are domesticated, tamed. Many people treat them as pets. But... Some characteristics of the horse that are relevant to the act. Horses are not predators, they are prey animals. This means they're highly tuned to danger, whether perceived or real. Their natural instinct is to use flight as their main act of self-preservation. If provoked, they can deploy force. And so, at particular times, or in particular circumstances, they can bite, buck, rear, kick, bolt, shy and whip around. So where does the expert come in on the Animals Act? From an equestrian perspective, there are further key words, concepts in the key limbs, in the three limbs. Was the horse restrained? The kind of damage likely to be caused, the likelihood of injury and the likelihood of severe injury, the likelihood of the damage being due to the characteristics of the species, the particular circumstances and the characteristics being known by the keeper. The expert's role is to advise the court 
on these elements given the dynamics of the incident. What are some of the equestrian dynamics? The difficulty difference of witness evidence because equestrian incidents happen very fast. Some behaviours happen in a split second. They can happen anywhere, in woods, gallops, in the distance, busy racing yards, competitions, where people are busy and not paying attention. Even when witnessed, perspectives may be very different. Recollections may vary. Assessing the likelihood of injury and linking that injury to the behavioural characteristic. A horse can display more than one behavioural characteristic during an incident, but it has to be the characteristic that caused the injury. In behaviour, we are talking about notes on a violin rather than a piano. There's a continuum. Quantification. There are no comprehensive statistics to analyse the impact of falls, kicks, bites, etc. No statistical probabilities. If someone has been injured, there has to be a likelihood of injury, but how to quantify it? Graduations in the behaviour affect likelihood of injury. Bucking. Bucking can range from a small playful bluck, like the first picture, horse's head is down a little bit, bottom up, having a playful buck, to a bigger buck, to a fairly violent, explosive buck, where the ride is more likely to fall off. Rearing. Rearing can vary from a small lift up on the hind legs to a higher rear, all the way up vertical where the horse is in danger of falling over backwards. <coughs> Biting, a small nip, probably because it's been given too many polos, <laughs> to a full-on bite and even to an attack. Kicking. Kicking can vary from just a warning kick where a horse will lift a hind leg and say, you're getting too close, keep your distance, to a kick out with one hind leg, to what we call a double-barreled kick where both hind legs lash out. And in a recent case I had, one poor gentleman received one of these kicks and it killed him instantly. Bolting. Bolting is when a horse instinctively runs away. It is so frightened, it will run into anything, through anything, crash into things. It's therefore very dangerous, in my opinion. Many riders might think they've been bolted with when actually they've just lost control of the horse. But real bolting, such as in this picture, you can see the horse is running away, it's crashed into something, and it keeps running even through a fence. So likelihood of injury, as you can probably tell from these pictures, very much varies on this particular situation and the degree of the behaviours shown. So how do I compile a report on a case? Was the horse restrained? This is very rarely an issue for experts. What behaviour did the horse display that caused the damage, or the injury we're talking about mainly? Was this a behavioural characteristic? Is this characteristic likely to cause injury? If so, is it likely to cause severe injury? What were the particular circumstances that caused this behaviour? Can the specifics be established? And would the keeper be aware of the characteristics in the particular circumstances? There is a defence, section 5. Was the injured party wholly at fault? Was the injured party an employee or did they voluntarily accept the risk? The best way an equestrian expert can help a case. You'll all be familiar with the various stages of a case. 
Sometimes a site visit might be helpful, sometimes it's not, and this is normally open for discussion, dependent on each case. Occasionally, I would ask to do an advice note, or I might even be given some initial evidence, perhaps have a strong view on it, and have a discussion and say, would you like me to do an advice note first? Because basically it might save you money, and you don't need a report. <laughs> but it's not my decision, obviously. Then I would normally do a draft report. There'll be a discussion, a conference call nowadays with council, and it's very helpful if you've got the claimant or the defendant on the phone as well, because you can pick up a lot of information that isn't in the witness statements, which can be helpful. There'll be amendments to the report before it's finalised, and then there'll be a joint statement, normally with Charlie Lane, <laughs> and occasionally a court appearance. So it's easier, if possible, when re receiving instructions to have all the client's evidence in one go. Other things, hygiene items, horse passport, veterinary information, horse medication records. These don't all apply to every case, but horse and rider forms, accident radar reports, health and safety policy, risk assessments, yard diary, and if possible, relevant texts, social media posts, photographs, videos. But the key word for me is relevant because I was once sent 108 videos for a low-value case, took five hours to download them all, at which point I have learned I should have done something sooner and said, just send me a handful of relevant ones. And I don't know how many texts. I mean, it was crazy. So, where are we? Nothing's happening. Interesting cases. So I know, oh sorry, yes, we've already had a discussion on Ford versus Seymour Williams. Um, Charlie and I were both on this case. We had a lot of agreement, so we didn't appear in court. But it is an interesting one. As you've already been told, the horse was out hunting. It briefly napped, reared up over backwards and died. The rider sued under the Animals Act. The judge found that the particular circumstances couldn't be established, but he did find the horse's rearing was probably due to catastrophic internal injury, a heart attack, and as discussed, the claim failed because the keeper could not be expected to have knowledge of such a characteristic in the particular circumstances. So experts agreed the behavioural characteristic was rearing, it was agreed this was the cause of the injury, and that it would be likely to be severe because it reared up and went over backwards, landing on her. Two likely causes were put forward. Again, Charlie and I both covered it. The horse napped and reared, or it suffered probably a heart attack. But what was significant was the judge finding that it was the heart attack. It didn't have a post-mortem, so it couldn't be shown to be sure, but that was probably why the horse reared, and therefore the keeper would not know that the horse would behave like that in those circumstances. How clear-cut is the Animals Act? <laughs> I'm sure you've all heard of Merva Healy versus Henley. And again, I'll whip through it because we've talked about it already. The Henleys owned a horse and two ponies. They were in a well-maintained paddock with electric fences and wooden fence. Horses broke out bolting, ending up on a dual carriageway. Poor Mr. Merva Heady collided with the largest of the animals and brought a claim under the Animals Act. So at county court level, the, the um, sorry, defendant, I always get this mixed up, lost one, lost one. Defendant's one, defendant's one yes. So it was then appealed and overturned, and the claimants won. And it then went all the way up to the law lords, who were split 3-2 in their decision. Any further, this case would have gone to penalties. <laughs> but I, I won't talk about the ramifications legally for this case, but for the equestrian sector as a whole, it was huge. It, 
demonstrated that all horse owners are liable, even when they've acted responsibly and the specific circumstances of the case aren't known. And for me, the moral of this case is that everybody who owns a horse should have insurance. To summarise, in principle, the three limbs of the Act, act su apply suitable thresholds and checks and balances. Understanding the specifics of an accident, incident injury is not always straightforward. Likely injury and severity of injury depend on the behavioural characteristics displayed and or to what degree, and of course the interpretation of the word likely. Quantitative analysis and data sets on specific acts in equestrianism, such as injuries from falls, biking, biting, kicking, rearing, is limited. Establishing the specific circumstances that cause the behaviour can sometimes be unclear, differing or even not known. The expert has to use their experience and judgement to offer a likely cause. And in my experience, knowledge by the keeper is rarely contested. But every case is different, every case is individual. Different judges can find differently, even on the same case. Very much okay. Thank you. Okay. Would you be happy to take a few questions? Yes. Yep. Yep. Can I go first? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I've been cross-examined by you before, Jonathan. <laughs> this is a, a problem. Yes. Right. Not from um, you mentioned. Um, site visits and you're often asked yes. whether or not yeah. um, you think that would be helpful and in some cases it, it would be but others mm. perhaps not mm. so much. The other issue that often crops up, I'm sometimes asked about it, no doubt you are too, is whether actually going and riding the horse yes. in question uh, would be helpful, particularly where you've got a case under first limb of section 22B, you know, is this, is this mm. a, a nutty horse? Mm. Um, and. I just wonder what your thoughts are on that, because of course the chances of the horse behaving in the way it did at the particular exactly. time of the accident exactly. is pretty unlikely. Yeah, yeah. Even if you don't do it, you may be criticised yes. for not doing it. I don't know and and if the other experts done it, quite. are they at an advantage? Yes, quite. So what, what are your thoughts on that one? Quite often it's four or five years after the accident. Mm. And like you say, for me then, you know, a horse's temperament doesn't change. Mm. Um, but its situation and management might well have changed. And I think it depends on the type of horse and the type of circumstances and fall. If it's a riding school horse, you know, it's probably not going to have changed that much. I did have a case where the poor lady was paralysed and it was some years down the line. And from the evidence, it had bucked the owner's husband off before she got on and tried it, and she was a novice rider. You have to ask why she got on it. Um, she wanted it to go happy hacking. And actually, riding that, it clearly was unsuitable for a novice rider. I was very careful, shall we say, when I got on it. So I think you ha looking in the round, the time scale, um, what type of accident, what scenario was it in, looking at the evidence, you can get a little bit of a feel. Yeah. So often it'll be a good idea if you and the instructing solicitor perhaps have a discussion about that. I think so, yes. Yeah. 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 Good. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Anybody else have any questions for Henry? Yeah. Henry, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.